Good morning and welcome to St. Michael's Episcopal Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. We welcome you here with us this morning in this space. Before our service begins, just a few reminders this afternoon, beginning at 4 p.m. until 5 p.m., please join us for a Blessing of the Animals drive through uh, Anyone and everyone is welcome to attend. Please bring your pets and join us here at St. Michael's. And then beginning at 5 p.m., uh, join us as well on our Facebook page for a live stream of the Holy Eucharist. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Isaiah. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He expected it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I expected it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and it shall be overgrown with briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed. Righteousness, but heard a cry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, they'll respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is amazing in our eyes Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a, a people that produce, the, that produce the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. May I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Places tell stories. Places tell stories because in every place exists a meshwork of creation, weaving a narrative throughout time. People, plants, animals, insects, and all of God's creatures interact with the land, shape the land, inhabit the land. And through this inhabitation, the land gains memories. The land holds the laughter of a young girl as she swings from a branch into a river. The joyous refrain of a family yelling into a cavern and receiving back their echo. And the deep sigh of a couple as they watch the sunset over the ocean. Places tell stories. And over time, these stories become memories embedded in the land. These memories are then passed on through generations. They shape a collective consciousness, one we can choose to accept or one we choose to disrupt. And we see place telling a story in the song given to us from First Isaiah. The prophet writes of a carefully cultivated vineyard. And it is clear that the beloved in the song tended the crops, nurtured the soil, and even protected his vineyard from danger. The song seems to suggest that the beloved learned from the land, that he took time to hear the story that the land told him what crops would grow given the climate, what crops had been there before given soil quality, and even what animals, including humans, participated in the ecosystem to enable a healthy yield. Places tell stories, but we don't always listen. And this listening part is key because without it, vineyards yield rot in grapes, like what ended up happening in the Song of the Vineyard in Isaiah. Because you see, if we don't listen, we instead presume to know the story of the places in which we dwell. Or worse, we impose our own narratives, constructed for us and by us to keep us in power. Instead of turning to the land for her wisdom, we blame her for producing rotten grapes. 
We complain about her climate. We chastise her soil. We kill her animals. We manufacture the story told to us by the place just to fit our own narratives. So places do tell stories. The question we must ask, however, is who is the author? So when I started this sermon, I said that places tell stories because God's creatures inhabit them. And from this inhabitation, the land gains memories. I then painted idyllic scenes, a girl laughing, a family singing, and a couple falling in love. But what if I had this all backwards? This notion that humanity gives land meaning, purpose, and memory led us to rotten grapes. And we can surmise how we arrived here by looking to our gospel. In Matthew, Jesus gives context to first Isaiah's prophecy. Jesus explains that after initially caring for the land, the landowner leased it out and left the country. Human greed crept in. No longer was the landowner present to listen to the story of the place. Rather, he tried to rewrite the vineyard's story to be one of profit. Then from this imposed narrative of profit came the exploitation and murder of marginalized persons. And returning to Isaiah, enter rotten grapes and God's righteous anger. So God, speaking to God's people through the prophet, God then names abuse, neglect, violence, and injustice, both against people and the land to be the cause of rotten grapes the cause of unmet expectations of what the world could be. Places tell stories. And like the idyllic scenes, the land, well, she also holds the tears of the young boy who went to bed hungry again. The last breath of the migrant woman who died crossing the Arizona desert. The blood of the enslaved, which is seeped into the US's soil and the footprints of the Tuscarora tribe on whose land we stand today. Places tell stories. And over time, these stories become memories. These memories, both the joyous and the traumatic, are then passed on through generations. They shape a collective consciousness, one we choose to accept or one we choose to disrupt. So what if I had it all backwards? What if places tell stories not because humans give meaning to the place, but rather the place the land gives meaning to humans? Perhaps we only are because we are here, embodied members of an enmeshed framework located in a physical place which tells its own story of redemption of which we are only but a small part. This reversal is so important because if we continue to believe that humans give meaning to place, positioning ourselves at the center of the narrative, we will continue to yield rotten grapes. We will never learn to listen. Not to our neighbors, not to the environment, and if we're not listening to the life that is around us, then we are most certainly not listening to God. And if we continue to yield rotten grapes, well, Jesus tells us in our gospel that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, that is us, and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. But, and there is always hope, if we flip this anthropocentric mindset and allow place to give meaning to humanity, then suddenly, we're brought into relationship with plants, animals, insects, and all of God's creatures. And when we do this, then maybe the end of the song of the vineyard sounds a bit different. Instead of rotten grapes, we hear of a bread and wine which gives life and sustenance to the whole world. Instead of white supremacy and hatred, we hear of liberative love. And this is the ecology about which St. Francis of Assisi taught the world 
as he modeled Christ for humanity through his love and compassion, not only for people, but the entire place in which he dwelled. St. Francis preached to the birds, he reconciled with the wolves, and he invoked praise of God through the created world. He allowed place to tell his story rather than forcing his story onto place. And as a result, St. Francis found himself at peace with God and by extension, the whole world. Pope John Paul II recounts about St. Francis that as a friend of the poor who is loved by God's creatures, St. Francis invited all of creation. Animals, plants, natural forces, and even brother sun and sister moon to give honor and praise to the Lord. The poor man of Assisi gives us striking witness that when we are at peace with God, we are better able to devote ourselves to building up that peace with all creation, which is inseparable from peace among all peoples. Peace with all creation is inseparable from peace among all peoples. What St. Francis taught us then is that we, people, plants, and animals are inextricably bound up in one another. A truth upheld by faiths and spiritualities, liberation movements, and climate advocates across time and space. He taught that we only are because we are here, embodied members of an enmeshed system located in a physical place. And St. Francis saw us, saw himself in this ecology because he believed in an incarnate, embodied God who located God's self in a physical place out of love for creation. St. Francis knew that Jesus Christ wasn't some spiritual being without a body located in the ether. No. St. Francis knew that Jesus Christ was, is, and forever will be God incarnate who dwelled among us, dwelled in a place, listening, learning, and redeeming, disrupting the collective consciousness of a fallen world. So as we come to the end of this season of creation on this feast day of St. Francis, Consider what story the place you inhabit tells you. What memories does this place hold? Do some digging. Listen for the truth and the wisdom that sits in the land. And then, if necessary, confess and rewrite your narrative. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you, and also with you. In peace, I bid the prayers of this people for the cares and concerns of the church and the world, and for all people in their daily life and work, for those endangered by war, for our enemies and ourselves, that all people might respond to your love and open their hearts to reconciliation. And for this community, the nation, and the world, for the just and proper use of your creation, for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, especially those affected by COVID-19. We pray for the Episcopal Farm Worker Ministry in Newton Grove, and the members of that community who struggle during this difficult time. May they find hope. For the special needs and congregations of this congregation, hear us, Lord. We pray for all who have died, especially Dr. Richard Salibi, and those who have died during this pandemic, alone and afraid, and those who died in war, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers.
and the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.